Well, so welcome everybody. I'm Eric Brown. Uh, this is Tim Sweeney. We've got Eric Keeler, who is also part of the original team, and you all met Ossie earlier. Uh, we're going to talk about Peacemaker and the design behind Peacemaker and things like that. So a quick question is just how many people have played Peacemaker? All right. And so then some of you will see it for the first time. How many of you have heard about it before today? Okay. All right. Great. So since Ozzy gave a lot of background information, we're going to be starting with opening up the game and then we're going to just talk through a lot of the stuff that you're going to see. So the first version of Peacemaker debuted uh, 10 years ago, uh, 2005, it was the very first version, uh, and this is the much more expanded modern version uh, that came long after that first prototype here at the ETC 10 years ago. Uh, some of the things that immediately come to mind looking at this page is the languages. You want to go at the language section first? I think this is one of the few games in the world that actually has a English, Arabic, Hebrew language selection. Um, but it, it's, it's kind of obvious when you think about it, why. Um, I mean, I guess I'm going to jump in on that one. So we had talked about a bunch of things. We were going to show a bunch of slides in the design. We were just going to sort of walk through this one. And me and Tim got a chance to catch up. And we thought a lot about the things that are going on in this space now and what we thought about when we were making the decisions back then. So I think we're just going to jump in whenever something jumps to us. But so one of the things we talked about was there's a lot of games out now that are doing what a lot of people asked us about back then, which was making sort of metaphorical games. So you see games like Papers, Please, and things like that that are based on sort of hypothetical situations that are driving to get that transformational experience by giving you the experience but not really tying it to real people, real issues, using photographs, things like that. So I guess the thing that that intro video and some of the things we're going to get to in the game, using actual real video footage, real images from the conflict, and actual conflict and the use of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as opposed to sort of a hypothetical conflict, um, was a, an important decision early on that um, obviously impacts a lot of the feel. And I think our discussions back then and some of the things that went on were that it was very important that it was about real people and that it was tied to something real and that you got that emotional response and that we used real video footage and real photographs to make sure that we drove home that it was actually a real conflict about real people. And so I think it's been interesting to see the approach now going on where they're taking sort of the other bent and doing a lot of sort of metaphorical games about issues and there aren't a lot of games that are using real conflict um, or real issues or real people, but that was obviously um, a huge impact from, from what we did and something that we had to be very sensitive about when we were using uh, media in the game. Something you might also pick up on, this feels like a real game. Like this is a title screen from a game. This is not from some sort of weird 
thing. This feels like a game. It has gamer DNA, it has games DNA deep inside of this project. But it also had the realism that we were trying that, that is achieved by showing you the real thing. So a lot of that is there's this translation effect between the real conflict and the gamer conflict. Um, so that's one of the tensions that we struggled with while building it, but um, might as well just start her up. And this is the first choice that we present everybody with uh, once they choose to start is, hey, take a seat at the table. Who do you want to be? be? Who are you going to be for the next 30 minutes? Uh, so I guess another sort of design choice that, that went on early on in the project and things like that I think is worth speaking to is, I mean, one is you always have to choose who is the player going to play because, I mean, that's obviously crucial. And for what we were trying to do, it was very much sort of the balance between you need to have empowerment so that you can take actions because if you're just somebody on the street that can't actually empower or impact anything then what is the gameplay and what are the choices that the player's going to have and things like that. So I guess that's reflected in that you are the Palestinian president and the Israeli prime minister. Um, the goal is to experience it as a person um, but you have to choose roles that actually have actionable things that they can do in the game. The second part of the screen that drives home is uh, it's about walking a mile in somebody's shoes. And in a conflict, it was obviously very important that we had both perspectives. So the team started off by doing the Israeli prime minister, um, but realized that it had to reflect both sides of the conflict. If it was going to be an experience, that if somebody played it, they got the full picture and they had the chance to experience the other perspective of what they might internalize and things like that. Um, so even in that, just the fact that you can play both sides and the gameplay is very different for both sides is something that's different than a lot of games. In a lot of games, they'll choose one perspective and you play that and that's how you get the experience and the understanding. For us to get the full understanding, you had to give two different games, essentially using the same mechanics, um, but different underlying engines to experience both of the perspectives. So let's start with one. We'll, we'll randomize it. Uh, and this is a difficulty selector. This is also, this is something very common with games. But this is also a choice. Uh, you come, everybody comes to this game with some level of preconceived notions. Everybody comes to it with some sort of ideas in their heads before they sit down to it. One of those ideas is yeah. how violent, how, how really tough the problem is. And allowing them to make statements like this about how they view things it, it filters into the actual underlying game mechanics. So if you believe that ultimately it's a terrible place and things are going crazy, you can make that statement to us as the game developers here, and that gets reflected. Um, we push back on the player's preconceived notions through the game mechanics. One of the things about the mechanics, the mechanics of a game are the message of the game, and that's very present here in, in, in Peacemaker. But this is one of those ways that you can come back on that. Sure, and we'll get into what this actually drives in terms of the game. Um, the other one is just that for us it's important that you can actually win the game. I mean, part of the whole experience is that we want you, I mean, it's called Peacemaker. It's, it's supposed to have some um, empowering effect on the players. So when we were tweaking and tuning the game and how difficult it was to win and things like that, I mean, for some people, they thought for realism it should be very difficult and you should probably lose more often than you win because, you know, did we actually come up with a solution? Um, but it was also important that somebody would be able to play it repeatedly and hopefully win the game at some point so they can have that, that sensation of feeling like it is possible and that there is a way to do this. And so some of that is, if we made the game strictly the violent difficulty level and the casual player never won the game, did they really get the experience that we wanted and have the chance to walk away with sort of a positive feeling about what could happen in the conflict and things like that? How are you feeling? Yeah, let's, let's, let's play some rounds. All right, why don't you play and I'll, I'll narrate it. Sure enough. Uh, so we are the Palestinian president, uh, and we're being told, okay, we're going to enter our term of office here, and uh, we're going to have some ability to make some change. Uh, this is very, this is a very gamer-focused mechanical structure. It's a strategy game. I'm going to be a leader, and I'm going to take actions, and then stuff is going to happen. Uh, but very right off the bat, uh, something happened that I didn't account for. Uh, which is, a, this is a, a news event, a bulletin that's occurred. Uh, this immediately grabs me into what the heck, 
uh, is going on that I have to respond to. This is the first news event uh, that occurs that I have to think about what my reaction to this is going to be. And from the perspective of a game mechanic, my actions are uh, my tools that I can use to respond to this, which are the choice of those tools was a very important piece of, uh, yeah, so sure. you can, you So can. just jumping in on one last one of this, I mean, this was before it all got packaged together and everything and we put the video at the beginning, this was the same thing that I was speaking about before, which this event and being able to watch that video and things like that was supposed to drive home immediately to the player that this is real people, that there are serious consequences and, and life loss and things like that. So both of them are very dramatic from each perspective. Uh, so my tools on the left, actions uh, that I can take, uh, political, military, constructive. Uh, there's also, I've got score bars, I've got the watches, I've got all of the various players in the conflict, I've got their opinions of me, I've got, uh, I've got global opinion, I've got my own internal opinion of my own uh, regime, sort of the, the, the faith that the people have in my ability to lead them. Uh, and these are, these are real things, these are real groups that have real values and opinions about the situation and the conflict. And some of this comes across uh, just through the text, but uh, mostly uh, the game of Peacemaker is about translating the actions that other players are taking, the actions that I'm taking, into how that reflects uh, the conditions and the attitudes of people in the world. And this is a very like you can build a game mechanic around that if you understand how these actions push and pull these values. That's a very clear game mechanic. There's, no, there's not a whole lot of ambiguity, but what those actions are, what they represent, and how people react to them, that's where you're injecting the knowledge of the political statement. Uh, that's where you're injecting how the real world situations are impacted by what you do. Uh, so let's, let's pick something to take in response to this action. Sure, and I guess um, to just segue on top of that one, I mean, going back to the game design moments of it, I mean, obviously this is not every action that the Palestinian president can take. Um, so even just this portion of the experience that we wanted the player to have when they first come in and they're sort of going through that action list, the things that are there are sort of a first learning moment in and of itself, like what should I care about, what are the actions that I can take? Um, and so again, choosing security, construction, political, things like that. Um, we'll see a disparity when we jump to the Israeli side of the security options are obviously much different on the Israeli side. The construction actions are very different. The types of things you can do and just making the player notice what they're able to do and what we chose to do. And then there's obviously the part that says they started with a very huge list that was sort of brainstormed of everything that the Palestinian president could do or the Israeli prime minister and at some point it had to be pared down. And that was where a lot of the going out to talk to individuals, NGOs, content experts, and political figures and things like that was to find out what are the issues that we are going to pare it down that should be in there. So what issues through gameplay do we want the player to experience? And so I'll choose one that um, the reason that sort of manage the Palestinian police is in here and restructure leadership and order police training and things like that is one of the major issues that people talked about as the Palestinians was um, corruption in the police force or their ability to provide security or do these types of things. So if that is one of the major things they want a player to understand about what their situation is and some of the issues on the ground, then that leads to this action existing <coughs> so that you can experience what that means or learn that that is even a concern of somebody on that side and things like that. The surface level is just what can you do? Then the secondary level is what reaction does that have? The tertiary level is seeing how that changes the climb towards or away from peace. And then there's a reaction even on top of that where the player's personal response to what this game is saying about the situation through its mechanics. Um, so there's all those different levels that, depending on how deep you go into it, how much you're taking into this, how much analysis you do, reflection on it after the fact, um, it can hit you on any of those levels. One of the other elements, you just keep playing. Sure. Um, so this is the reaction to our event. Um, the uh, problem here that we did, uh, behind the scenes, what's happening is we've taken an action that is very, uh, 
wouldn't say aggressive, but a very, a very pressy action, a very determined action. And the conditions that the world was in right now didn't really support that very well. So we got a suboptimal reaction to our, to our attempt. Um, you could have gotten, if the conditions were different, you would have gotten more of a success. Uh, success, failure, uh, it's not really the same as like a happy face or a smiley face. This is a very subtle indicator. Uh, your score is also a subtle indicator. Well, this is a more blatant indicator. The national approval has gone down by five. Um, so trying to, one of the things that we ask the player to grapple with is they're playing through the game and they're trying to understand. If they're coming at it from the perspective of, I want to win the game, we're trying to get them to figure out how winning the game translates to this stuff. Because it's not obvious. You look at this stuff and you don't necessarily see how this is going to get me points. Right? So how does this action get me points? And when can I do this action? And when can I not do this action? That's the learning that comes from trying to win the game. Somebody who's trying to understand the conflict has information about the conflict in their head and they find it here. And then they're like, okay, I know this about the conflict. I know that uh, the Palestinians don't have control over most of their natural resources. How is that portrayed in this game? And in this game, uh, we say, okay, advancements in your status as having control of these resources, of having this infrastructure, comes at a cost. And that cost has to be funded by somebody. Well, who's going to pay for these great things? Well, that's the world community. That's finding the money somewhere. Uh, so if you come to it saying to yourself, I know how to solve the problem, they just need all of this stuff, we say, that's great, here's what the real world kind of looks like, where are you going to get the money for that stuff? Why would people trust you with that money? And so, okay, I'm not coming at it from a gamer's perspective, I'm coming at it from a, I know how this, I know what I want to get out of, um, I know how I would do things. And now this is, the game is pushing back against you with more of a bit of a, Maybe you didn't consider this. Maybe you didn't realize this angle. So for both a gamer coming in trying to maximize their score, they get a learning from what is it that is doing that, because maximizing your score is the path towards peace that's promoted by the game. And then on the flip side, it's, OK, I know this thing, and I'm going to push on that and see where this simulation takes me. Uh. So I'll jump over and show a little bit of the Israeli side just so you can see the difference. And I guess to sum up some of the other stuff in there was, I mean, there's the action list, and so you're trying to educate by showing them what they can and can't do and giving advisor roles, and so just what's there and what's not there. So what he was saying, there was that push for control. When I tried to build something, you had to ask for money. None of that stuff exists on the Israeli perspective. So just having to reinforce and do that every single action, like he's saying, sort of ingrains that if you came in thinking like just do these things, your inability to do them or the fact that when you take them, it is like sort of these turn-based strategy game um, genre. So I mean, it is all about action and feedback. So you get both that first one that says the first thing we might teach you is that the outcome is not what you expected and you thought, well, everybody would want to fight corruption, so why did I fail at doing that? And then if I failed at doing that, why did it lead to a negative score? Because it made me look weak in front of the people. I didn't have to buy in. All the stuff that goes into those. But the basic game design is just, you get the, the visceral feedback from the sort of contextual journalistic approach to we took real world stories and put that content in there. So you get that, you get sort of the, everything is not like you see because some things are gonna re respond positively and negative depending on the outcomes and things like that. So you get a little bit of that complexity. And then the last part is that score. There was a choice to have two scores because having one score was way too simplistic. I mean, essentially you're, sort of modeling the zero-sum game or things like that, where something might be good here, bad here, and you've got to kind of keep moving them up, and that's really what conflict resolution is about. And that wouldn't have been achievable if we just had one score, because you might see a net positive, but if you're ignoring all the other things, it was actually long-term a negative, because it's not going to allow you to do other things. So those are some of the design choices in trying to put all those different feedbacks in, because you needed to get to that nuanced feedback loop um, in what was going to happen. And they, the, the balancing act here is the Palestinian president you're trying to discover, or you will, you will discover it as you play, is between the, the, the faith that your people have and your ability to convince them that you are for, for them versus 
how the other world, how the outside world views you, and views your, your policies. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, like when you were marketing this, um, did you get any people's opinions that they felt that you might have had an agenda in the advice? And just like um, an example of like the World Peace Game, I don't know if you've seen it on TED Talks, John Hunter's World Peace Game, where he uses Sun Tzu as his advice. Like when you're giving this advice, where is that, what source is that coming from? And when do, do um, how do people that um, play this game or review this game feel about the advice both given to the Palestinian side and to the Israeli side. I guess I'm thinking of it as like if there could be a game like for ISIS. I mean, ISIS is interesting that they use modernity. They use the tools of modernity to spread a message against modernity. And how would we reach those kinds of people to make a transformative? Uh, we, we do, one of the things that we publish uh, that I recall that comes to mind is there's a list of assumptions that went into Peacemaker. There's a list of places where if you agree with us on these topics, you can come into Peacemaker and get the full experience. If you have concerns or you don't believe in some of these assumptions, we're not sure, like we say it out front, we're pretty sure Peacemaker is not going to have as much of an impact uh, it, because we can't like, we haven't been able to reach common ground with you. I mean, so that, that, that a player puts in, a, like, a profile and answers certain questions, is that what you're saying? No, I mean, so a very straightforward one is, to win our game, essentially, the win solution at the end um, implies that there's a two-state solution. There's plenty of people that even work with us on the game that believe in the one-state solution. That changes. That's a very fundamental view of, like, how you would solve the conflict. And so he's saying that we, we posted all that stuff. And basically our way of dealing with that in terms of marketing was to say that um, these are things we had to do to make this game. And our goal was we met with as many people as possible to put their narratives in here. And we hope that by playing the perspective that you don't understand, that you'll learn something along the way. And if you don't agree with the, the end game of it, that's not really as important as that you took the time to think about it from their perspective, and so we've gotten a lot of support from that. So even the people that believe in the one state solution at the end of it would say that, you know, but I learned this, or I thought it was really good, or this was represented well. So I mean, you're never gonna satisfy so everybody. So your perspective was given out, I guess that was my question, that you, you had a perspective that was already taken. Yeah. And, and there was some, there was a, a lot of learning amongst the, the team itself, but really it came down to levels of how much, how much could we do with one product, with one scope, and also uh, really this, this, this was not intended to be a hardcore simulation with a lot of hypotheticals and a lot of realistic, like when you're adjusting troops and you're creating police cordons and you're releasing uh, people from, like it's not a simulation. You're not moving units around. You're not ordering battalions. You're not finding a person's name in a list and saying this person is released in a prisoner exchange. It's generalized. So there's a limit to how much authentic simulation you can put into something that is going to appeal to a mass audience, to be approachable to a mass audience. Uh, and and I, I've always felt, I, I think the design team always felt, that being upfront about the general assumptions of the arrow of progress, even saying mm -hmm. there is an arrow and it goes to a goal, and that you can climb up that goal. That's a very bold state, right? That's huge. If you don't agree with that, then yeah, throw stones at Peacemaker. Build your own version of Peacemaker. Build your own thing that expresses your thoughts for how the world really works as a game mechanic. And that, that is a, as an expression. That's more and more prevalent now. But I really, I really haven't seen um, something quite quite like this. But that, it also goes to the, the real world versus the fantasy worlds. Right. The fantasy worlds, it's easy to say, this is my hypothetical, and nobody can challenge it because it's my hypothetical world, and the rules I put into it are the rules that are truth. Uh, so real world is always going to have exposure. In, in, um, I wanna, I'm sorry, excuse me. I just okay. want to finish this one okay. real quick. Um, so one of the mechanics just from the game design perspective that I wanted to show that I think is was important to the broader experience of Peacemaker was you got all of the actions and you get the feedback and some of the complexity from that. 
And then people would start to find the rhythm and they'd understand like, okay, these are the types of actions, they're gonna have these kinds of things, they start to get into the flow of knowing what they're doing. We have these sort of random world events, so this is what happened after a couple of turns. We hold off in the beginning so that you don't get overwhelmed as a player. Um, then these events will just happen and they will have the same sort of effects that um, feedback would have. And this one's really just to say, as much as you then might want to criticize this person for like, why aren't they doing these things? Because it seems to work, is that there's lots of events that happen in the world that are outside of your control that can derail whatever you're doing. And so that beginning when we said calm, tense, and violence, it was really just how much events are gonna be outside of your control that mean that you could start to get a flow and feel the game and, and make positive progress. And at that moment, we're gonna derail you because that's part of the reality of, of the situation. And so I just wanted to... You've been very heavy security on this play for, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah. Your, your Palestinian rating is um, minus And just negative stuff, trade restrictions. I was trying to force some issues to happen. Yeah, uh, great. Okay. Eric? Yes, sir. Did you guys speak about the tension, the core tension? The core tension of the game mechanic. Uh, so I think I touched on this briefly. Uh, for the Palestinian president, those two scores, uh, one is internal approval, faith in your, your ability to lead, that you're representing the people, that you're protecting, you're looking out for their interests. And the other is the, uh, the exterior world, uh, the ability to say, okay, you, you can be in charge. We trust that you're not doing the wrong things, uh, which often every action you take is gonna piss off one side and make another side a little bit happier, or vice versa. So you've got a teeter-totter. How do I make progress in a game like that? Well, it's not exact. There's other things that happen behind the scenes, but they're not quite as obvious as the push-pull mechanic. For the Israeli prime minister, it's Israeli approval and uh, Palestinian approval, or, or more rightly called Palestinian trust, trust that you are a partner uh, as opposed to an aggressor. Uh, and right now, his actions have been painting him as an aggressor. So while he hasn't really achieved, he's achieved a modicum, he's got an Israeli approval of 12, he's achieved a modicum of faith in his people that he is watching out for the Israeli people, he's protecting their security, uh, he's trashed his reputation on the Palestinian side. And um, interesting to sort of that dynamic was that uh, underlying this and other sides, so to, to some ways, there's sort of Israeli security, Palestinian trust. On the Palestinian side, that sort of triangle of it'll go one side or the other and you have to balance them until they start moving in the same direction is about internal approval and world approval because you see a lot of the things in the internal stuff, restructuring, working with Fatah and Hamas and things like that requires that you, you manage those so that they'll agree to let you do things. And then there's a lot of asking for money and support from the external community, so it's world approval. So am I doing things that build internal trust at the best of global, which means that I can't fund other projects and things like that. And those were sort of the core balance underlying each one of them. And so those sort of existed on boards in the room. And the security and trust one after sort of came to that through trying to figure out how to balance the game, how to, the core mechanics would work. Um, people started coming out and giving big speeches about how that was the underlying issue in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which was sort of interesting that we came to it through the, the mechanics part of games and they came to it from the geopolitical side of it um, after the fact, so that was... Yeah, we, uh, we, uh, we, when we were originally trying to figure out what are the mechanics underpinning this game, uh, like we know the topic, we know the point, we know what the win condition is, what are the day, what are the turn by turn mechanics? Uh, that was very hard to determine because the other work in that area had all been very detailed to simulations where you would have like a, uh, a simulations where people would be given packets representing you are this person, this is what you care about. Let's all have a, a fictitious sit down where we're all representing role playing each other's views. It's very soft. There's nothing that we could really drive a, a game with numbers like you can't. If it's about understanding the other person's side, how do you make that a game about numbers? They seem at core conflict. Um, but we, we stumbled across uh, that idea of the push and pull where, okay, uh, it, it started off as a dice game, really. Uh, every turn we ask you as the Israeli Prime Minister, do you do a conciliatory action or do you do a security action? And based on that, we will change some numbers and we roll some dice. And if your security was higher than the, uh, the attack value, you 
you prevented an attack, but if your trust was too low, you didn't get any, you didn't build any 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 value on the other side. Uh, and so the, the teeter-totter uh, came in at the beginning and led the rest, filled out the rest of what the, the story of this game was. So yeah, let me just wrap up and then, so one would be is if you haven't played the game, it's available free on our website. Uh, there is a mobile version coming out in a month or so. Part of it was the technology we built this in like seven years ago is failing and floundering and was just sort of letting it go. And then when it really started dying, when new OSs came out, all of a sudden I started getting emails from all over the place. Uh, we're a community group that uses it. It's not working. What can you do for me? Or I'm a school that teaches it, or I just downloaded the game. So I realized that there is still a large audience that plays Peacemaker. So we're going to try and get that out. It should be soon. If you want to be a beta tester, feel free to email me and I'll, I'll get you in because I need some people to check it on different mobile devices, things like that. Um, it is also lunchtime now. So if anybody wants to leave, just so you don't have to feel rude getting up and walking out while questions are asked, but we'll stay and answer any questions that you want. So if you want to stick around and do that, but we want to let everybody go to lunch without making you feel rude. I'm sorry, come here. I wonder if you've had an opportunity to watch Min Maxer's play, and if so, can you talk about what happened and, and how they experienced it or, or what they did? Because it seems like that, you know, that tension and the sort of the the context of the game um, are a little bit at odds with that. But I know those players are out there. Um, and in fact, I'm pretty sure Tim is one of those players. We well well I, I designed this game to you foil want to people to like the me. Rest of the group, oh, okay. Case, yeah. So so uh, the, the the story the, the the experiential story of a true person who has played a lot of games sits down in a game like this and they say I understand the ebb and flow of these mechanics. The way to win is first this button, this button, this button, this button, this button, but 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 and now I win and say, okay, this has maximized my score, I have managed to succeed, or they find some degenerate case. They're like, if I do things in this exact combination, I can win by just doing Apache strikes. Well, so, something like that, like completely foil the game mechanics. Uh, the game mechanics compared to your average gamer's game are deliberately, uh, they, they're obscure. We, we, we hide them at a distance. You don't exactly see what lever behind the scene is causing your police action to have a suboptimal effect. Um, you'll discover it over time, but it's more about evoking a mood and evoking a sense of, I understand kind of what's happening here, rather than mathematically I predict that this will happen in response to this. And there's a tremendous amount of behind the scenes just fuzzy logic and die rolls. Like, these conditions that you can see can be identical 100% and you'll get different results because that's just somehow how it happens. So two things on that one is part of it is those, I mean, the, the randomized events is partly because it's part of the educational tool. It also means that no two plays will ever be the same and we will derail that, which means that you can't just publish, you know, ABBA, up, right. down, up, down, look for it, that, that whole thing. Um, the other one is, so I've also witnessed people doing it, so kids, I mean, adults will play, they play very slow, they read everything, they think about everything, and then we would put it in front of kids, and it's just like, bam, and they're just pressing stuff, and you're assuming that they're doing that, and some of them are doing that, and then at the end of it, you have a conversation about the conflict, about the issues, and even in the process of playing like that, they internalized a whole lot of what we actually wanted them to internalize. So it's sort of like, they're gonna do that. You hope that you don't accidentally design something that they will get the wrong. I mean, right. the fear is always that they find a hook that then they talk about that says, I figured out I could blow up the country and win the game because we left some hole that was unintentional. Mm -hmm. um, so we just did a lot of play testing to try to make sure that that hole wasn't in there. And then we just saw that people would still get something from it, even if they were trying to do that, because by doing that, they still had to inadvertently live it or something. There's a really lousy way of handling some of it, which is there's a mechanic inside of the, the system that prevents you from just repeatedly doing the same actions over and over again. Right. Well, some other speeches are generally so good. Kind of modern. experimenting with the system in some ways, as well as the results. Okay, so your goal for the game is to spread awareness and inform people as an educational topic. 
who is your target market that you expect to play this game, and how often do they play it? Just once or weekly? Or I mean, so this game has now been out for seven or eight years. So really, you have to go in a wayback machine to when we were making it. And like the motivation behind Aussie and the original pitch team was just, we're just going to prove that this can be done. So there wasn't really thought about who's the end user and how big is that market. It was, can we show that a video game can cover a subject this sensitive, do it well, to prove that games can be more than Grand Theft Auto at the time. Um, as we turned it into a business and we're looking into all of those types of things to figure out who is that demographic, I mean, this is stuff me and Tim wanted to talk about, there's just limited time. I mean, distribution channels are the biggest obstacle there, right? You're, you're still fighting to this day that it's a game, but do you put it in the games market? Do you put it next to books? Do you put it next to documentaries? Where is the right place to reach the audience that wants to play these games or to prove that they are for them and things like this? So just a lot of things in that realm have changed that make when we release Peacemaker Mobile, it'll be very interesting to see because those distribution channels didn't exist. So we were going to, I mean, they've changed and not changed. So I guess one thing I wanted to talk about was back then we'd go to like Microsoft Casual Games to try and get it, put it in their marketplace. And they said, we can't do it because it has flags and real people. So you would think that games have changed a lot and there's a lot more appetite for these types of indie games but still fairly sure that we'll get rejected by the App Store. So it's like different players, same result in terms of getting our, our product to the audience. But also like to Aussie's slide, of now the average demographic is 35. Seven years ago it was a little different and people didn't perceive it. So we would go and get presentations and there would be the, the 40 year old law student in conflict. It's like, this is great. I can't wait to give it to my son. And then we'd have them play the game. They're like, this is amazing. Now that person's not embarrassed to think that like I should play games. So hopefully we can actually get to that audience that when we first distributed it, wouldn't play it because they just assumed it was a game. So it's not for them. And that perception has changed in the last seven years. So we'll see. Um, but I guess we don't have time to go into all the different marketing channels we went to. But it, once it went out, it was anybody, which is always a great answer for marketing. And then partnering with the Perez Center to actually get it free in the hands of people in the actual region and community groups that use it for the, the benefit of it is a great conversation starter and eye-opener and transformative game. So in terms of direct impact, that was what we did to make sure the people that would be directly impacted had access to the game with people to facilitate it. And then broadly in the world, it's been played all over the world, like 80 different countries. It still gets downloaded, things like that. So people find their way to it. To Tim's point, a lot of them might be people who are preaching to the choir on some level because it's called Peacemaker. You're going to show up. You're probably not going to be um, a terrorist coming to play Peacemaker with the thought that maybe I should open my mind. But I mean, that's just sort of a different challenge altogether. Um, did you guys adopt any particular mechanical or narrative strategy um, for disarming political biases of players? To, is that something that you considered? Like, how do we actually do this with this game? <coughs> <laughs> the Sarma, uh, so so one of the one of the main tools uh, that went into the game design guts was you can't you can't win with a simplistic approach, right? Try to make it so that just hitting the conciliatory actions every turn you'll lose every time. Hitting aggressive actions every turn you'll lose every time. So for a large majority of the people coming into it, at least in my, my experience, they, they tended to swing, they, they, they tended to have like in their heads either this is the approach, this is the approach, or I don't know what the approach is, it's an unsolvable problem. And all three of those mindsets would be, could be transformed by Peacemaker. It, 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 it hit each of them. For the people who said it's unsolvable, here's a solution. Oh, it's unrealistic. Well, why? Now we're asking the question to you. Why do you think it's unsolvable? Why is this wrong? For people who press one button or the other, you're like, you're not looking at it from the other person's perspective, right? So that's that's the most uh, comprehensive uh, thing that I can come up with. And mine would just be, if you're saying, did we work with social psychologists to understand bias and how you do that and what are the types of interactions to do that? I mean, when you look at a game like this and other people have this issue, I mean, you, People were always asking us, what is your conflict resolution model that you're building this off of? And so we had lots of people that worked in conflict, rec <clears throat> excuse me, conflict resolution that had their models that we could have statistically mirrored ours off of. That becomes a whole project in itself that takes lots more time. 
we could have worked with social psychologists, we could have worked with things. We chose to just go the approach of, um, we're gonna go and meet with a bunch of people to get their perspective and try and build the narrative and see what happens just because of resources. I mean, doing all of those things simultaneously would be great, but it also can model the waters in terms of, our end goal was just to user test and what was the, the takeaway from the players and fudge things as needed to not hold to some um, published conflict resolution theory out of Harvard or something like that. And it'd be great to incorporate a lot more of that stuff in there. It was just ours was from the experience response user testing, not the the model um, mapping approach to design, I guess, would be one way to look at We had to make it compelling enough as a game to stand on its own as a game, because uh, we were going to try to reach people who would play a game. Uh, and if the game was not, if the game wasn't playable, if the game was more of a an, an expository piece or something, we, we wouldn't have gotten that audience. We also had to build something rather quickly too in 15 weeks, so that limits your ability to do research and incorporate a research program into a product such as this. Right, and then just, yeah. I mean, I think some of that is the the model mapping starts putting you down the, the civilization level of complexity and, and radically alters the scope of the project and, and loses sight of the end user experience as the, the key issue that we were going after. So you were talking about um, dealing with uh, kind of min-max approaches to the game and kind of wanting to thwart them a little bit by um, having the reaction system be very complex and then also having certain random elements. And then on the other side, we were just talking about people that play the game, their approach doesn't work, and they just think, well, it's an insoluble problem, right? But how do you balance those two? So, I mean, you want it to be a soluble problem, but you don't want the... Uh, you don't want the reaction system to be like utterly obscure. You don't want the random events to be so derailed. So like, oh, well, you know, because if you get enough random events and you don't quite understand the reactions you're getting, I can see a player very quickly arriving like, well, this is meaningless, you which is kind of play. what a lot of Westerners think about the conflict to begin with, which is really right. bad. Then we're reinforcing negative stereotypes and things like that. That's uh, the secret. That's why you go back and, yeah. and play on calm, and we'll take it easy on you a little bit. Okay. Um, you talk I mean, there are, people, other, there are other things that, they do? that, yeah, I mean, so kids will just keep playing until they win. So that audience is great for games because they won't throw up their arms and be like, this is ridiculous, it's unwinnable, because <laughs> they'll rise to the challenge and they'll just play faster until they get to the end. Um, with older, slower players that are going to read everything and think about it, I mean, we do run into that. They still get some learning along the way. We hope that the replayability, I mean, ultimately, another part is, is the game, if you're playing quickly, I mean, it's not that long. I mean, you can win in an hour each side. If not less, kids will do it a lot faster. So that's also a choice that even back then, we were choosing to make it a casual game in the realm of that, but it's even way more casual now because we understood that both the subject matter, the complexity of it had to be simplified to get it all across in a shorter experience because nobody's gonna sit down and play 40 hours of the Israeli Palestinian conflict. I don't care how engaged in the subject matter you are, that's, that's heavy. But even, even compared to something on mobile today, like a match three, Peacemaker is definitely, it's, it's a much harder, harder game to grapple with. So it's, it's got a complexity to it. Uh, that's kind of undeniable. It also works in our favor because the more complex seeming a simple simulation is, the easier any weird things can be ascribed. Because mm -hmm. uh, you don't know where it comes from. Yeah, people have all sorts of in, it, like one-off reactions where something really hit, and that's not intentional. Yeah, and so going back to your social psychology question, so there's been a bunch of people that did research on it since then. And so we always saw in the beginning, people gravitated to saying one side was harder than the other. Like, I was able to win this side, but not this side. And then it was just interesting because that would flip-flop. So then it made that we didn't really design one side harder. There was biases coming into the game that made it harder for them to take action choices that made one seem easier or harder than the other. So I mean, I think that's where we started thinking we won, is that if you have people telling you that each side is too hard or unwinnable, but then other people saying the opposite, that we probably landed somewhere in the middle, yeah. and so we're yeah. all right. Did anybody figure out that the whole point was that their biases were, were making it hard for them to succeed? Do you, I mean, do you, did, you, did you get any feedback uh, from individuals about that? Um, 
so I guess an, an interesting anecdotal story was watching over um, sort of a Arab player who was playing as the Israeli side and started doing the things that would help build security and then realized I was watching it was like oh that's just that's what they would do and so you could tell that there was the bias coming in they're like I don't want to do those actions because by doing them I'm going to guess what my, my supposition might have been and then realize that you need to do those actions for whatever reason and then things like that. And I think that happens sort of on both sides. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean initially you're going to have that, well, or just people who are sort of, um, it's called peacemaker, so maybe I am just a true non-violent and I'm going to avoid those trees at all costs and then realize that it's just not possible and you're gonna have to delve into some of those if you're gonna sort of build stability. And so you're sort of forcing somebody to go against what they wanna do because if they wanna win the game, they're just gonna have to. Um, so we saw a bunch of that in all the different directions. And if that answered the question. Yeah. Mr. Keeler. Uh, so what I have an armchair theory that you know, after watching people play it, years ago, it seemed like people would go through it either pretty quickly or else they would just flail, and I don't know if, it, if you saw that later as you continue to work on it, but I, I'm, I'm convinced that Peacemaker is probably a type of psychological test, but I have absolutely no clue what the construct is. <laughs> I'm just curious if you still, you know, if you continue to kind of find those sorts of things. Do you think it's actually testing something, potentially? Or you might want to defer and say no, which I don't understand. But I, I, it just I mean, like so one is like, it, it's interesting. I mean, there's a bunch of researchers out there. I should put them all on a page somewhere so somebody can read them and all the things that people have tried to ascribe to that. Some of the interesting part of doing the mobile version is, as a distributed one, we couldn't put all the game analytics to see like how many people actually finish the game. So we'll actually get to start seeing that, like how many downloads, how many plays, how many times did they get the win solutions and things yeah, like that. Cool. So that'll be kind of cool to see as it goes. We also obviously now for debugging on that have all the logs being put out everywhere. So I can sanity check that the logic got translated right and stuff like that. So we could also start capturing all of that as well and really get into the details of it just because now that it's, it's mobile, we can capture all that gameplay without having people sending us logs and stuff. So it'll be way easier to, to research some of that moving forward. Is, is there copyright problems? Like, I and mean, you have live pictures of things. Is that something that you have yeah, to Yeah, no, about? so that's another part of the marketplace. I mean, some of the, you'd have to ask every game designer, did you make it abstract because it was easier and safer for all the things we talked about, about being attacked about the realism? Or did you do it because of cost? I mean, one of our biggest budget items when we set up the company was there was not as many repos as there are now for media. We had to go to Reuters. Reuters had no idea how to license content for games because they had never done it before. So we spent upwards of like 60, 70,000 for all the video footage and all the images and stuff like that in the game. So people would always say like, can we port our conflict to it? It's like, well, there's a lot of game design you're not taking into account. So the mobile one's coming out, we sort of, did a pass in the engine. Our idea back then was to be able to make these on a lot of different things. The markets just didn't support us being able to afford to do it. So we've got about 80% of making it cheaper now that we have an underlying engine that's way easier to publish to mobile. So hopefully we can start doing more of that. Now are you able but to But there's up still just the cost. I mean, like that's a big expense. Are you able off. to update like when new things happen so that it keeps it current of what's going on in the region so that you were able to insert new? Yeah, we built the ability to do that. Unfortunately, there's not really things that drastically changed to the point where we needed to. There was a couple of things right before we launched where like Gaza got independence to some extent, so we updated some things. Um, we were going to be able to do that. I mean, the game is still fairly relevant eight years later without having to change anything. We could change a couple names. I mean, there's a lot of things I want to add into the game, and so we can do that easier now because you can do update publishes through all the distribution channels way easier than us back then because we would actually have to ship a whole new game. Um, we actually then, our company went off to make play the news so we can make daily news games because of that issue of wanting to engage people on a regular basis. So we went a whole different design angle to answer that. Um, and all of that is possible, just the, the reality is, is that inciting incident and a lot of the action feedback isn't going to change on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's really not, a, I mean, not as much as making that headline something that happened yesterday, the rest of the underlying game is going to be the same. I mean, we're already projecting into the future, theoretical, once you start anyway. Have you guys faced harassment and sabotage for writing this game? 
we thought we would get a whole lot more. Um, so that's another one that'll be very interesting in going out on mobile is there's way faster ways for people to find out about it and to hassle you about it. So I'll let you know this go around. Back then, for the most part, we just got mostly positive stuff, people writing saying how much it changed their perspective, this, that, and the other, but it also meant that since the distribution channels were a little tighter back then, the people that were finding us were probably more inclined to be on our side as it, it might be now. Most, most people back then would just ignore it if they didn't feel it. Now they kind of would, like, I imagine that if Peacemaker came out brand new today, 10 years later, instead of being completely ignored by people with that opinion, they would feel threatened by it and they would want to speak up against it, uh, which I think is one of the risks going into the market today. So we'll find out. I mean, obviously, Aussie's background in the Israeli military, things like that, we thought we were going to get all that bias. So in our credits, we listed out all the people we went out to involve from both sides to make sure that, you know, these voices are in there. It's not just Israeli military thought um, or propaganda. It's so at least one conspiracy theorist could. Yeah, but so then we finally got one like six years later that, that wrote something about how it was Aussie and it was obviously a conspiracy and propaganda and this and that. But it took a while. This we thought it was going to be fast.